All right, this next set of videos is going to be on measuring physical quantities. So if you if you kind of remember the flow in, in terms of how instrumentation works, like you have some measure in. So in this case, I've got a whole list of them, force, acceleration, pressure, displacement, velocity, and then uh, these are linear and then angular and uh, displacement and angular velocity. So there's some physical uh, quantity in the environment that and you want to capture that. You want a quantitative uh, measurement of it. And so what, what you need is you need a sensor. And what that sensor needs to do is it needs to have some sort of physical change in response to a physical quantity. So, you know, the, the easiest one is, right, is like a, a thermometer and the old, old school ones with mercury. And when the temperature heats up, mercury expands. And so you can kind of uh, easily uh, model that, that uh, temperature change or that, that density change as temperature uh, affects it. And so in that case, you're measuring the temperature and the mercury would be the physical change that you can view. Now, since we're doing um, you know, instrumentation, we want to measure physical quantities with electrical circuits. So in this case, what we want is when we want a physical change, we want some sort of resistive property or voltage property to change uh, when the measure and change or the physical quantity changes. And so I made a list of a bunch of these different things, right? So you've got, you know, like how do you measure force? Uh, the, typically what's done is a, a weak stone bridge is used. And, and then what a weak stone bridge has is it has a strain gauge. And I, I drew a figure here. If you notice, I put a green star here because, you know, believe it or not, strain gauges are, are used in conjunction, are, are used in a very interesting way. Yes, they measure force because you can apply a stress to them and the resistance uh, changes with strain. And it's a, very, it's a pretty linear relationship, at least in the beginning. And, but you can combine that with uh, other things, so like accelerometers, you can have you know, sort of a pendulum that swings, and I'll go into more detail on every single one of these here. Um, but the idea is that these strain gauges can be used in, different, uh, in multiple different places. So I wanted to do that one first when I go through these. And uh, I'm not going to go through all these now because I'm going to go through them in subsequent videos, but if you stick around, I'll, I'll talk about every single one of these and how these work. Um, so the first one I want to go over is the strain gauge. So again, you want uh, uh, some sort of measure and, and a physical change. Well, the strain gauge by itself doesn't actually measure a physical quantity other than, uh, other than strain. And so in order to get force, what you have to do is you have to measure strain and then multiply that by E, capital E, the Young's modulus, and that will give you stress. And then stress is force divided by area, so you can multiply the stress by the area and get force. And so in, in, in this case, what you want is you want a way to measure strain. So that's really the physical quantity you're measuring, and then you multiply it by Young's modulus to get, to get stress and then force. And so a, a strain gauge, what it will typically look like is we'll have a positive and negative terminal, and it'll typically have these wires in this, uh, in this sort of coil pattern. And what they'll do is they'll they'll glue it very, very strong to a material so that when the material itself moves or, or, or stretches or strains, the strain gauge itself will also move. And typically what, all, what uh, the parameter that you're looking for is the resistance itself, and so R is in ohms, and there's a, a, a resistivity of the metal, of the, of the material in the wire, rho, times the length divided by the area. So if the length increases, the resistance will increase. Now it turns out that this variable resistivity, excuse me, is very, very small. And because it's small, you can't just hook this up to a material and strain it because the voltage differential across that resistor will be so small that you won't have an ADC, an analog to digital converter that has enough bits to, ch to accurately uh, describe that change. And if you remember in the last video I did with the staircases, basically that voltage is too small to be captured by the bin width of that AD, uh, of typical ADCs. So what they do is they put it into this uh, Wheatstone bridge here, and I think this is called a, a, quarter, a quarter bridge uh, rectifier. 
And what will happen is you hook this up to a voltage source, positive and negative, and then you put this in sort of this like square pattern here with R1, R2, R4, and R3 here. And R3 is your strain gauge, and there's an arrow through it because it has a variable resistance. And so what you do is you apply, you, you, you slap this thing on there, and you apply stress in this direction, and the resistance will change, and R3I is sort of the initial resistance in the material, and then delta R3 is the, uh, is the amount of, um, is a change in the, uh, in, in change in the resistance. Now, if you use this equation and this equation, and you do um, some Kirchhoff's or Kirchhoff's voltage law and current law at these two points A and B, as well as C and D, what you'll find is that the voltage here, VI, can be used to solve for strain. And so uh, you have VI, so you need to hook this, these two terminal up, terminals up to a voltmeter or an analog to digital converter on your CPU to convert that voltage signal to a, uh, a digital signal and save it on your computer, right? Remember, we're gonna, the, the, the physical change is gonna create a voltage, then we throw that through a signal conditioner, maybe an amplifier or a filter, and that's going to give us sort of a, a, a measured signal. That's why I have a tilde. You run it through your analog digital converter to get your binary number, and then you put that in storage somewhere on your computer. And so you hook your voltmeter up to this, you apply the strain, and you measure VI, and then you use this equation, knowing the resistance and all of these things, as well as the strain gauge factor. This is your strain gauge factor. That's a constant. And you'll get strain. And so it's a little bit complicated. What you're doing is you apply stress, you measure voltage, and then you compute strain. And then once you know strain, in this case, you can multiply by Young's modulus. So this is stress applied. You don't actually know what this is. This is a question mark. This you measure, and then this you compute. And then you do Young's modulus times stress, or sorry, Young's modulus times strain, you get stress, and then force is stress times area. And then there you go, you get force. So it's a little bit cumbersome, right? You have to apply, you have to apply the stress to it, measure voltage, compute strain, and then compute stress and force. And all of these other uh, um, physical quantities are, are sort of act like that. And so I'm gonna go ahead and uh, put a box here so I remember and say that I have, uh, I don't know if I want to say adequately described, but I have described how a strain gauge works and the equation that you can use. Uh, typically when you buy a strain gauge, they will tell you the strain gauge factor. You have to, it depends, if you buy the Wheatstone Bridge, um, all of these resistance will be in there. If you get a fancy one, a lot of times it'll just tell you strain via serial, but if you built one yourself, you would have to put this whole thing in a, you would have to build this whole circuit and put the power supply in there and then use these equations. You also have to make sure, if, you're looking, if you look at this equation, you'll notice that R1 and R4 are not in this equation. The reason why they're not in that equation is because when strain is equal to zero, VI is zero. And in order for VI to be zero, all of these resistance quantities, or at least these two resistance quantities and these two resistance quantities need to be the same. If they're not, then you're going to have an imbalance in voltage across here. And that typically, uh, people say that that's an imbalanced uh, weak sum bridge. And so you need to, uh, if you build this yourself, you need to make sure that you balance the resistances and, and tune those properly so that when you apply the stress, you can use this formula correctly. Okay, I think I've exhausted my, uh, my time here. And so this is... Uh, Wheatstone bridge and uh, a strain gauge to measure strain and use that to measure force. All right, so let's talk about acceleration now. So I just talked about the strain gauge and what we're going to do is talk about uh, how to use an a strain gauge and an accelerometer and then also how to use a capacitive displacement sensor in an accelerometer. I'm going to be talking about MEMS accelerometers and MEMS stands for microelectronic measure measurement system microelectronic management, microelectronic measurement system. And so basically they're, they're very, very small sensors. There are way better YouTube videos on how the mechanics work. I'm just gonna go over sort of the math here uh, and just do a brief overview. So in this one, 
where you use a strain gauge, what you do is you have a small beam with some Young's modulus and moment of a cross moment of inertia. So like like if you take a uh, a cross section of that beam, it'll have some inertia associated with that, uh, which resists bending. And basically, you put this thing in a viscous fluid, and you, the whole thing accelerates upwards. Well, if this whole box accelerates upwards, what's going to happen is is that an equal and opposite reaction is going to happen to this mass, and this mass is going to deflect downwards. The deflection, W, is going to be proportional to the strain if you put a strain gauge right up here. Okay? And then if you remember, if you've taken mechanics and materials, you know that this deflection is a function of the force applied, and the force applied is this mass times acceleration. And so what you can do, basically, is if the, if the whole thing accelerates, you can use the strain in the strain gauge to measure W, the deflection of the beam, and then use uh, W to solve for the force using this equation. And then finally, you can use force to solve for acceleration. And that's sort of how uh, one of those works. Now, the problem with this is that even if this isn't a viscous fluid, this whole thing is going to have dynamics associated with it. And so this whole beam is going to vibrate a little bit. Like if you bonk it, like that, that, that whole pendulum is going to vibrate like crazy. So another way to do it is to, uh, is to, is to use something like this. And what they'll do is they'll attach one end of two capacitive plates to some sort of similar thing. And again, this is going to vibrate too, but the, uh, typically the, uh, the mass of these things is so small and the distance of these plates is so small too that they, uh, they'll, they'll, if you bonk them, they'll still get kind of uh, messed around, but they're, they're a lot smaller and they're a lot easier to, uh, they're, they're a lot more accurate. And so basically what happens is if you accelerate in this direction, this capacitive plate will get closer, and this distance d, as this distance d gets smaller, the capacitance will increase. And so what you can do is essentially you can say, take the dielectric coefficient, this is a constant of the material, that's a function of the material you're using, uh, epsilon naught, that's the permissivity of free space in a vacuum, so you should need to look that up, that's a constant. And then this is area and this is d. And so what you can do is you can measure the capacitance, based on how much this one of these plates moves. So this plate is going to be fixed, and then this plate is going to move, and that's going to change the capacitance. So basically the flow here is this whole thing accelerates, you measure the capacitance, and then use this equation to compute D, and then with D, you can, ouch, uh, okay, yeah. If you know the displacement here, you can, uh, based on the material properties of this sort of section here, you can use D to solve for the force that was applied to create that, and then again, just like before, use the force to solve for air, for the acceleration there. And so that was a very, very quick overview on, on two types of uh, accelerometers, one using the pendulum that accelerates, and then one, another one which is called the capacitive displacement sensor. And if you notice, you can also use a capacitive displacement sensor to measure displacement. Um, these are very, very small displacements, obviously, but you're measuring D, um, in this equation here, so you can use this to to uh, to measure displacement as well. So I'm going to go ahead and, uh, and 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 box those. Okay, measuring pressure, and so pressure. The first one, which is the one that I typically use in in pedo probes to measure speed, is you have a pressure transducer, and the pressure transducer. What you do is you have um, pressure coming in on two different ports and you call the top one P0 and the bottom one P1. And what happens is, is if the pressure in the bottom increases, there is a membrane that is going to deflect. And if that membrane deflects, it's going to strain. And if it strains, you can measure that strain, and then you can use that to compute pressure, since that strain and that stretch is going to be proportional to the pressure. And, and actually, this is going to be delta P. You're not going to measure pr pressure. You're going to measure delta P. And so, you need some sort of reference pressure in order to get the actual pressure that you're measuring. Um, and so this is a pretty popular way to, to measure pressure. I mean, the barometer uh, on, on small like drones and stuff will use this. And then I'll show in pedo probes. That's another way you can, uh, you can use those. Um, this will create an electrical signal, right? Because you're measuring strain. And strain is coming from that, that uh, VI, the, um, the voltage from the Wheatstone bridge. 
Uh, I wanted to put this on here just to kind of point out that there are other ways to measure pressure and it, they kind of operate on the same principle as this one and basically you have this fluid in a tube and this port is closed and so there's a constant pressure in here. Um, but this port is open and so if the pressure increases it's going to push down on this tube and because this pressure is constant if the pressure on this side increases it's going to push the fluid into that and compress that. Um, Actually, it's not that the pressure in there is constant, it's that the, uh, the number of molecules, I guess the, what am I trying to say, the mass of the air in there is constant. And so if you apply more pressure on this side, it's going to compress that, um, it's going to compress that, those molecules of air in there. And basically, if you, uh, you have sort of a, a scale here on the side, you can calibrate that to measure based on pressure. And so that's another way to, uh, to measure pressure there using a, using a manometer. All right, and so this one is done, and moving on to linear displacement. All right, moving right along here to linear displacement. So the first way to measure linear displacement is with a potentiometer, and a potentiometer is basically a variable resistance um, circuit component. And so basically what you do is you have these two rigid rails hooked up to a voltage source. If you then have this material where the entire length is a resistor and you hook up this end to a, this to a fixed end, you can move this slider up and down and measure the voltage on the, other, uh, on the side here. So if you have this whole thing all the way down, right, the uh, x is going to be zero there is not going to be a, there is, there, there won't be, a, you're basically measuring the voltage drop across these two materials. So this, this is a, this is a connection joint here, right? And so you're measuring, you know, this is, a, this basically turns into a voltage divider and you're measuring the current and the voltage drop across here. And so because you're changing the resistance, basically if you, if you close this, you're basically touching ground to ground and the voltage just goes to zero. If you open this whole thing all the way up, the current just goes right through it, and then the voltage that you measure will just be equal to the voltage of the, the supply voltage. And so what you can do is you can do some voltage divider math, and you realize that X is just equal to L, the whole total length of your thing, of your, 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 your component, times the voltage that you measure. This is the voltage that you hook up to your voltmeter divided by voltage source. So as I was saying before, if you measure a zero voltage, it basically means that X is zero, the whole thing is closed. If you measure the same voltage as the source voltage, that means VI is equal to VS, and that cancels, and you just get X equals L in this whole thing. The problem with this, of course, is that you, only, you have a fixed length. Once you go, you can only go down to zero, and when you go out all the way to L, you, you have to stop. So they're really good for like short distances, but you can't measure like hundreds of meters, obviously. Um, same thing with capacitive displacement sensors. I talked about this earlier. You have these two capacitive plates, and the capacitance is going to change with respect to um, the distance here. And I didn't mention this in one of the last videos, but in order to measure capacitance, because you have to measure the time constant, you have to send an AC voltage through a capacitive displacement sensor to get that, um, that rise and fall. Uh, basically, you're measuring the, uh, the cyclic response of a, of a known sinusoidal input. It's a little bit uh, more complicated and, and beyond the scope of this course. I really just want you to understand that like, if you change the, the distance of these two plates, you change the capacitance and that sort of affects an electric quantity. Whoops, this needs to say linear displacement. Linear displacement. Beautiful. Okay, and then of course there's ultrasonic sensors. So you've probably seen these really cheap like $3 ultrasonic sensors. They have an echo pin and a trig pin. They have like these two mesh circles on the front. And basically what you do is you, you fire a, uh, a signal, a sound wave out of one. It bounces off of an object and then comes back. And then basically you measure the time it takes for that signal to go there and bounce back from the echo to the trig. And that basically will give you distance D um, based on that. These functions here, uh, I, I think I, in, the, in the, like in this one here, and in the manometer and even the pressure transducer, I put that these, these distances are just functions of such and such. 
And the reason why I'm not writing a specific equation for these is because it, 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 there, there's a lot of minute differences and it really depends on the data sheet. So if you buy one of these circuit components, I recommend taking a look at the data sheet and there will be calibration coefficients and calibration constants that will tell you how to relate the uh, measured voltage to some sort of physical quantity because uh, typically the manufacturer will calibrate all that for you. Okay, so you've got a linear potentiometer that you can raise up and down, but you have a fixed length. You've got capacitive displacement sensors, which again, that's only going to measure small differences. And then for larger distances, I think these measure up to like 100 centimeters, um, these will uh, ultrasonic sensors. But then you even have like laser range finders, which I think fire like a longer laser, and they operate on the same principle. And I think those go pretty far. I think you can buy those on like Lowe's or Home Depot for pretty cheap. Okay, so we're, uh, we're cranking along here, potentiometer and ultrasonic sensors. So next is linear velocity. All right, for linear velocity, I'm going to do these three first, Doppler, integrate, and derivative, because these two sensors kind of relate to each other since they're more of an aerospace uh, component to measure wind speed. They don't necessarily measure linear velocity. They really more measure uh, incoming wind speed. And so you could, you could technically just put these outside um, and just have the wind hit it and then you'd measure wind speed, or typically what's done is they're put on airplanes, that, they, that way they can measure ground speed and headwind, or ground speed and airspeed, and then compute headwind based on that. Um, anyway, so I'm gonna do these three first. So the last two are pretty simple, basically integrating acceleration. If you measure acceleration using some accelerometer, you can just integrate that with respect to time, and just if you know your initial velocity, you can integrate it. Now the problem with this is that this acceleration uh, term is A, going to be discrete, so you have to do a, uh, a, a summation. So every time you get a measurement, you do A times how long it took you to take the, the previous measurement, and you just add all those up together to get the current velocity. Now, every time you make a measurement, you're going to have some inherent error, and so since you're going to have some error in your measurement, every time you integrate, you're just going to get farther and farther and farther away from the solution. So typically, you need something that's not as inaccurate when you're doing that. Um, I would encourage you to put an accelerometer in your car and just like accelerate and then slam on the brakes and then accelerate again and then plot that accelerometer data and you'll just see how noisy it is. Um, it's pretty terrible and if you integrate that it's it gets even worse. You'll see it's probably accurate in the beginning and then it just deviates over time. Um, another way you can do it is if you are measuring distance somehow with like a range finder or an ultrasonic sensor or something like that, you can just take a derivative, right? So you can integrate acceleration or you can just take a derivative. And again, here I'm just using a, a finite difference method, like the first order, uh, first order difference method, where you take the, the current position minus the previous position divided by the, the time between measurements, and that will give me velocity. So if you're using a Doppler, right, so if this is, you know, if, this is the police officer on the side of the road, and he's firing a radar gun. Uh, basically, he's firing a beam of light, and, and light is, a, a, yeah, I think, I think what was it? it was Einstein or whatever, he said it's, it's constant, or it may have been Newton, I, I don't remember at this point. One of those mathematicians basically said this was constant. And so if you fire a light at something, and it, shine, it fires back at you, the speed is going to be constant, but the wavelength and frequency is going to change. And so basically, if you fire a light beam with some specific frequency and, and, and uh, wavelength, when it hits the car, it's going to return to the gun at a different frequency and a different wavelength. And you can use this equation here that basically says if you take your original wavelength times your new uh, frequency, that so you have to send a, a, a a light wave out with a specific wavelength and frequency, and then you have to have another sensor that is measuring the incoming uh, wavelength and frequency. Well, really, you just need to know the frequency it's coming in. And you use this equation here that says the output wavelength time, or the initial wavelength times the Doppler or measured wavelength uh, frequency divided by two gives you the velocity. And supposedly these are very accurate because this is what police officers use to pull you over. Okay. So that's it. So that's to this, this section here. So Doppler, integrate, derivative, uh, those are done here. Now we're at the uh, how to measure wind speed. And so typically these two sensors, a Venturi tube and a pitot probe, are put on the, uh, on the end of a, a wing of an airplane. Sometimes you'll see them on the nose of a commercial aircraft. 
And uh, there are more complex versions of these, but these are sort of the simple examples. Venturi tubes aren't used very often anymore just because um, they're, they're not as easily, like they, they create a lot of drag. So basically a Venturi tube is sort of like a wind tunnel. And so you have this like, you know, entry point with some area circular, and then you converge it down to a smaller uh, throat here, which has some area A2. And so because of mass conservation, the mass flow rate through the big opening has to be the same as the mass flow rate through the end point here. And so M1 dot equals M2 dot. And uh, if you assume the density is constant between the opening and the throat here, because the area has decreased, the velocity has to increase on here. So the velocity is going to go faster. Bernoulli says that if the velocity increases, in order for there to be a consistent pressure, or basically in, in order for this relationship to be satisfied, the pressure has to go down. So basically what's going to happen is, is that the velocity is going to increase here, and then the pressure here is going to go down. Now if you hook up a pressure tap to this opening and this opening, basically you can put a pressure transducer, this is a transducer here, transducer. If you put a tr pressure transducer right there, you can have P1 come in here and P2 come in here, and then if you put a strain gauge in the middle like I talked about in the previous uh, part of the video, that will, that will stretch, right? And then that will give you strain, and then you can use that to plug in delta P down here. And if you know the area ratio and the density of the air, you can use this complicated equation here, which basically says A2 over A1 times, this whole thing is in a square root, and it's two delta P rho one minus A2 over A1 uh, squared there. And so, there you go. So if delta P is zero, basically there's no velocity, and then as uh, the, the pressure, the, the, the change in pressure increases, you're just essentially going faster and faster and faster. The pitot probe, down, pitot probe down here basically uses the same principle, mass conservation, uh, conservation of mass and Bernoulli's. The difference is, is that your probe here, it, you kind of need to like look at one, and uh, if, if I were teaching in person, I would pass around a pitot tube, but basically you have an inlet port that comes all the way down the length of the tube and comes in here, and basically the velocity is zero. And the reason why the velocity is zero is because the here, there's an entry point and an exit, which means the air flows straight through it. In this case, the air has nowhere to go, so it just builds up in here and basically creates what's called a stagnation point. And that stagnation point causes pressure to increase dramatically because velocity goes down. Remember, if velocity goes down, pressure goes up. So you have a ton of pressure in here. In this case, on the side, though, your, the tube has a bunch of holes around the ring. And so they're, they allow the air to flow over it, just like pressure taps on this side. And so that gives you the uh, free stream uh, wind speed and the free stream pressure. And so that will give you ambient pressure through this outer tube. And this is sort of like a three-dimensional hole. I, I basically sliced the pitot probe in half. And so you have one tube going down the center, and then you have this three-dimensional tube that kind of all coalesces into one and comes in here. And so basically, again, you put a pressure transducer down here, this P naught is going to flex more and more and more as you get more and more stagnation pressure. And then you just use this equation here. And it's easy because the velocity here is zero. And so this entire um, left-hand side falls away. And so you just solve for um, you just solve for this equation here. So you get two delta P over rho square root and you're, uh, and you're done. So that's pretty simple. Those are two equations that you can use there or, and even build. I mean, you could build, you could probably 3D print a Venturi tube and attach some pressure taps to it and you would get some wind speed, no problem. And then pitot probes run online for about $30. So you could easily buy a pitot probe for $30. And um, the, a lot of times the pressure transducers will have an integrated circuit on board already. And so it'll output voltage um, as a function of delta P and you just need to read the data sheet to convert it and uh, you're good to go. So now, how do you measure angles and angular velocity? So an easy one to measure angle is a potentiometer. And so you've, you, you may have seen those resistors that basically have like a, a knob on them. Anytime you have like speakers or, or uh, like, I mean, my 3D printer over there, like if it has some sort of knob on it, if it has internal circuitry, odds are it's got a potentiometer in there. And they're really easy to measure um, angle or rotation of, the, of something because you, if you remember in the, in the linear potentiometer, right, you had something that moved up and down 
And depending on where it moved up and down, it changed the resistance along that, that wire. And you basically do the same thing. So if, if this point is the knob here, and this sort of uh, you know, wire can rotate left and right, then if you just measure the voltage drop across that, right, if the whole thing is closed, right, you're going to measure no voltage because there won't be a drop across it. And at that point, you know, theta will be zero. And if you open it all the way open, you'll basically measure the same voltage as the supply voltage and you'll get pi. And so you can kind of just do this relationship here and it's very similar to the one from the linear potentiometer, which basically was, I think was like VI over VS times L. And in this case, it's VI over VS times pi. And so that's a very easy, easy way to do that. Um, before I get into angular velocity, I do need to talk about a photocell. So I added photocell down here at the bottom. So a photocell measures light, and the way it measures light is the material properties of the photocell, its resistance changes with light. So just like the strain gauge, the resistance changes with strain, a photocell, the resistance changes with light intensity. And so typically the way it's done is you put a photocell in series with a resistor, and then you measure the voltage here. And, oh sorry, this should be VI. You measure the voltage here with the voltmeter. And basically, if light, the more light hits it, the resistance across here will drop, and it changes the, the current in the entire loop, and you can measure that. There's a, a ton of data sheets on photocells, and typically you just have to calibrate them, so you hold like a known light source over your photocell and you calibrate that. And that will come in later videos when we talk about calibration. The only reason I want to use a photocell for the stroboscopic tachometer to measure angular velocity is that if you have, this is time, and this is a, a wheel hooked up to a shaft where there are holes around this, where n is the number of holes around this entire ring. Well, if you shine a light source at this, the light will only go through and hit the photocell, so you have a photocell over here, if it lines up with one of the holes. So basically what's going to happen is, is that you're going to get, you know, pulse. There's going to be no light, light, no light, light, no light, light. And what you can do is you can use this duty cycle to compute the angular velocity. If you get more pulses per second, it means that the shaft is spinning faster. If you get less pulses per second, it means it's spinning slower. So if you define n as the number of holes per rest, so that's how many holes are around an entire thing, and then capital N as the number of pulses you get per second, then all you need to do is just do big N divided by big N divided by little n, and that will give you omega in revs per second. Now, if you want to convert to radians per second, you've got to do a little bit of calculations to compute that, but that will at least get you the, uh, the revs per second. And so if you hook this up to some spinning shaft, you can put this light circle over here. So I'm pretty sure this is how speedometers work in your car. They, uh, they have this kind of sensor, maybe not with a light source and a photocell. It might be like a magnetic pickup and part of your transmission. But it operates on the same principle that you're measuring number of pulses uh, per second and then computing that based on the entire uh, circular diameter. And then that will give you angular velocity. These are also really cheap to build um, yourself. You just need a light source and a photocell, and you can 3D print a disc with holes in it, and it's uh, very simple to do. So I encourage you to go out and do that if you'd like. Uh, I think I'm going to go ahead and stop the video here. Um, I could talk about thermocouples, but thermocouples, bas yeah, thermocouples, the, basically what they are are two, two different kinds of metals, and basically if you heat it, the one metal is going to heat up differently than the other metal, and then that's going to create a voltage differential that you can read with your voltmeter. And there's not really much to draw with that. It's just two metals connected to some junction, and uh, and then a voltage differential. I mean, if you, if you want, I mean, it's basically like you know something like this, where you measure VI here, and this is like metal one, and this is metal two, and then here's your heat source T. And you need to look up in the data sheet uh, what VI is as a function of temperature. And there's huge equations to do that. Um, so I think I'm done here. I think I went through a lot of sensors. I didn't really go into detail or depth on a lot of them. The, the textbook that I've been using, and I, I, uh, I don't want to go grab it, but uh, the textbook that I've been using 
has a lot of stuff in there with different sensors. So I encourage you to go through and read it. This is sort of just like an overview of all the different sensors. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this video and I hope this helps uh, supplement some of the uh, uh, live instruction. And I guess I'll see you on the next video, which is chapter, which is on uh, like chapter six, mean and standard deviation and, and probability.